I'm Georgina James and I'm a partner in the private wealth team at Farah. Many of our clients, including ultra high net worth families, family offices and trustees who are responsible for investing and growing dynastic family wealth, are increasingly being asked by their various stakeholders to move away from traditional portfolios in favour of impact investment strategies. Embarking on an impact investment journey can potentially be daunting. There are many questions to consider relating to financial performance, access to the markets and compatibility of impact objectives with long-term dynastic wealth preservation and fiduciary duties. I'm delighted to be speaking to Sarah Gordon, the CEO of the Impact Investing Institute to discuss some of these issues. Sarah was appointed as CEO of the Impact Investing Institute in 2019. The Institute is an independent non-profit organization which is part of a global network of national advisory boards its mission is to accelerate the growth of, of and improve the effectiveness of the impact investing market in the UK and internationally. Before joining the Institute, Sarah was business editor at the Financial Times, where Sarah worked for 18 years. Before that, Sarah worked for Citigroup's asset management business and at Foreign and Colonial. Sarah began her career working for the UN Conference for Trade and Development's Debt Management Programme in Geneva. We plan to use our time today to discuss three main areas. First, we'll take a look at what impact investment is and what it's not, and how the market has recently developed. Then we'll tend to look at how one can think about incorporating impact investment strategies as part of an investment portfolio. And then we'll tend to think about the future of the impact investment market. Sarah. I have to start with quite a basic question, but terminology in this area can get rather confusing. So before we focus more specifically on impact investment, what in broad terms is the difference between ESG, sustainable and impact investing? Thank you, Georgina. It is true that we find that one of the biggest barriers um, for the impact investment market is understanding of what impact investment is and what it isn't. Impact investment is investment that delivers a positive social and in, or environmental benefit alongside a financial return. And it's really we think of it as part of a spectrum of investment choices and, and a spectrum of capital which goes first from what you might call traditional investment, where you're not taking any environmental, social or governance factors into account. And then you move more towards sustainable investing, where you're thinking about those ESG factors, but often so that you can reduce or mitigate your risk rather than because you're wanting to either benefit stakeholders or contribute actively to solutions. Those areas are very much where we're oper operating, where you're engaging in investment that delivers that positive social or environmental benefit with a financial return. And then, of course, you can move further along to the final stage of the spectrum, which is where philanthropy and philanthropic capital sit. And obviously there you are not looking for a financial return, but you are looking for a positive impact. So that's very helpful because I think often there's some confusion, again, because the impact investment market seems to cover a very broad range of asset classes, sectors and different themes. But as you say, a complete range of financial outcomes. But it seems to be the case that, you know, values based investing doesn't have to mean poor or poorer financial performance. That's just one of the potential options along a complete spectrum. It isn't, in other words, always philanthropy by another name. No, I think, and that's 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 one of the most important uh, sort of things to discuss, really, Georgina, because there is a widespread misunderstanding that impact investment involves necessarily sacrificing financial return. And the way I've described it along that spectrum of capital, you know, you may be making a trade-off of more impact for less return, but the space we're focusing on is impact investment that delivers market competitive returns alongside the uh, positive impact. And I think you, you, you have those options in a number of different asset classes. And one of the things that we're doing at the Impact Investing Institute is building up um, an evidence base around what that impact investment actually looks like. Because as you'll, as you'll know, when you're trying to sort of talk to people about um, incorporating more impact investment into their thinking or their strategies or their investment processes, it's really helpful to be able to show what other investors, other pioneers in this field have done. So we're building up evidence bases around local government uh, pension scheme investments, investments in social housing, investments by pension schemes in emerging markets, 
which really demonstrate very clearly that you can deliver a financial return alongside the positive impact. And I think it's 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 the reason I say it's so important is that those two the, those two sort of myths really that you started off with mm -hmm. that impact investment is philanthropic rather than investment and that impact investment necessarily involves sacrificing financial returns. Those are the two biggest hurdles that stop what you might call mainstream investors, whether high net worth mm -hmm. individuals, family offices, institutional investors more generally. It stops them engaging with impact investment. And one of the things that we're trying to do at the Institute, I mean, we're very much we were very much set up in order to bust myths. And mm -hmm. those are two of the most important myths to bust. That's really helpful. And I think it's interesting also to see, you know, you mentioned specifically things like social housing and therefore it's possible, for example, to have access to asset classes that, you know, some sort of property entrepreneur is familiar with already. It's a broad range of possible opportunities, which I think is really helpful. Just sort of thinking about how the market has developed recently. I mean, there's various commentary that says that the pandemic has accelerated the pace at which people are considering impact strategies. Based on your experience, how do you think that the concept of impact investment has matured over over recent years and what do you think the drivers for that are? Well I mean one of the most exciting things about us being able to set up the institute back in November 2019 and me indeed as, as you said in your introduction stopping a long career in journalism and starting doing this is that there is such incredible momentum behind this it and it's momentum that frankly has only been accelerated by the pandemic and by the recognition that the pandemic has brought to us all of I think a number of uh, it's affected. Um, I mean, obviously, it's had enormous and terrible, tragic consequences for many people. What I think it's also done, though, is given us a greater realization of our vulnerabilities and of the ways that social inequality, for example, lack of access to education or to basic health care, how it really makes you very much less able to withstand a crisis such as this one. I think the second one of the, the second thing it's done is really created an, a real, a, a much needed and greater sense of urgency around the climate emergency, because I think we've had this, frankly, dreadful recognition as a planet, you know, as it's not just this has been the, the virus has been absolutely universal. You are not protected by being a rich country, by being a, you're certainly not protected if you're a poor country. And I think this really has given us a sense of our vulnerability to the climate uh, emergency, as well as to future future pandemics. I think the other, you know, the other, some of the other developments that have been going on, go back to what we were previous question, or what we were just discussing. I mean, in the early days of impact investment, it used to be seen very much as something for private markets. It used to be a rather niche um, activity, both by, um, you know, the asset managers or indeed by individuals. And, you know, we have to be very thankful for some of the pioneering firms and individuals in this space, many of whom were in the UK. So I think we should feel proud of that as a heritage. But it, you know, impact investment originally really was very focused on private market opportunities and was therefore not, it was not for mainstream investors. And what you've really seen over the last few years, and it's it's speeded up absolutely massively, the, the, the concept and the investments available have really become so much more, so much broader. So whether it's it's you can you can still find impact investment opportunities, of course, in private markets, but also in public markets in we believe impact can be delivered via shareholder engagement in listed equities. We also have a vast range of real assets that can be invested in. And there are a number, I mean, last year alone saw an incredible um, number of financial innovations in this space. I think that one of the few positive things about the last 12 months is that we know that crises really spur innovation. I mean, the the real, uh, the worst, in a way, example of that was the nuclear weapons being developed and finalised during the Second World War. But on a more positive note, in 1942, William Beveridge published his report on the NHS. And, you know, there was that ability to really think ahead and think about yep. building resilience into into the economy after the war was over. And of course, we're, we're very much benefiting from that vision uh, and that visionary thinking now. So last year, you saw what you saw was a lot of financial innovation in the space of impact investment, because the need is so apparent. And you had, for example, uh, a number of blended finance vehicles where you see 
more concessionary capital providers teaming up or, or state actors teaming up with institutional investors. There is, for example, a COVID-19 fund, which is supporting entrepreneurs in emerging markets who have been really badly hit by the pandemic. That's got money from development finance institutions like this country's CDC but also institutional investors involved in that. And then there are other um, innovations like the first social impact investment trust that was listed on the LSE in last November, done by Big Society Capital, which has been doing, you know, for now for many years, been doing incredibly innovative work in this space. So there's product development, there's changing perceptions, and then there's much more widespread understanding and engagement with um, impact investment, all of which are very positive. And it's interesting, isn't it, I suppose, because one sort of forgets that actually impact has really a very long history. It's just perhaps that we've become more conscious of it more recently and a desire to measure that impact in a meaningful way. So it's certainly exciting to hear the the developments that have taken place in the, the most recent past. And just thinking about who is taking advantage, if you like, of these um, opportunities. We hear a lot of talk amongst ultra high net worth families, family offices and private capital that they're really driving funds towards impact opportunities. But are the most wealthy in society actually getting involved? Do we have any evidence to um, demonstrate this? And I think you touched on earlier the notion that it's always quite helpful for people to understand what their peer groups are doing in practice. How much data have we managed to gather so far? One of the things we're, we're actually doing this year at the Impact investing institute is is doing an updated market sizing of the impact investment market in the UK because the last time that was done was in 2017 and we believe it's moved on a lot the global impact investing network the gin does an annual market sizing exercise and it believes um, now that the um, impact investment market has grown tenfold however it hasn't split that down by category of investor. What we do know though, is that high net worth individuals and family offices have been real pioneers in this field. And that's for a number of reasons. They tend to have a very strong sense of mission. Many family offices are really about, um, you know, they, they have articulated very carefully why the money has been managed and for what purpose. And for us, that's very much part of the impact investment journey, really, is articulating that purpose. And a number of businesses or the more sort of institutional investment houses, for example, have not yet done that work. Whereas for family offices, for many of them and for high net worth individuals, that's very much a sort of foundational part of the of the work. They also tend to be more patient investors than some other market participants. So they tend to have a long term horizon. They tend to be very focused on passing wealth down the generations. And that perspective, that long term horizon is a very useful one to have when you're talking about impact investment, because some of the assets that you may be investing in, you're talking about a very long, a long scale involvement and a long, a long scale engagement. And indeed, this is one of the reasons why we think that pension funds, for example, are also natural, should be natural impact investors, because in many ways, they share a perspective with the, some of the family offices and high net worth individuals in that they are investing in a, a world in which we want to retire in or that we want to hand down to future generations. And therefore, we need to consider things like the environment in which that world, the environment of that world, you know, that the issues like social justice, like in educational access, these are important issues for future generations. And thus, investors with that very long term horizon tend to more naturally align with those considerations. And then there are advisors who focus on um, the helping family offices and high net worth individuals better articulate their purpose if necessary, but also see how that can then manifest itself in particular impact investment. I mean, there's a, an organisation called Active Philanthropy, for example, which will provide, you know, sort of useful case studies from other family offices to give a guide to 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 what can be done and I think that you know part of the challenge is that uh, you know we 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 talked a bit about social housing I mean some of this investment has been as you say being done for a very long time I mean social housing has a very long and wonderful heritage really but what hasn't often happened is that the positive impact has been articulated or measured And one of the things that we've been doing at the Institute, for example, is 
working with social housing providers and investors to help them articulate their positive social impact so that they can express that to investors so that you can really account for not just the financial return you're delivering, but also transparently for the impact that you're delivering. So it's an important, you know, some of the asset classes, there's work that needs to be done yeah. within the asset classes as well, not just by the investors. But it certainly sounds as though a cornerstone of getting started is making sure that you've identified what it is your, your values are going to be and the focus areas that you would like. And um, yes, I agree. It's certainly in practice that family offices and the clients that we work with, they do have the flexibility or more flexibility to potentially take longer positions or more risky positions. So the proposition certainly makes sense. I suppose... One concern that does um, arise when we're talking about getting started with um, making impact investments is that often people perceive those impact investments to be direct private equity type stakes in emerging market companies. And that can be potentially daunting for the would be impact investor because there can be negative perception around currency risk, um, liquidity risks and, and, and country risk. Is this the only option to access impact strategies? Are there options and things available in developed economies as well? You've already indicated there are a range of different ways to access impact strategies. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so I think, I mean, as you as you said, and I think it's a very helpful way of thinking about it. So I think that it is important to articulate what kind of impact you're seeking and where you're seeking it. There is, as well as some of the myths we talked about earlier, there is also a reasonably widely held myth, myth that impact investment is something that happens in international development and in emerging markets. It's absolutely not the case. I mean, we have at the Institute a, a very strong focus on the UK, and we know that there is a massive need for impact investment, particularly in areas and regions and communities historically underserved by institutional investment. So the, geographically, the opportunities are everywhere. Frankly, now in terms of asset classes, I mean, we touched on this a bit um, earlier, but there are private market opportunities and VC and private equity is, is, is very much part of that. And there are specialist impact investment asset managers who can help with those choices. And some of them, if you are a niche impact investor, you tend to be more focused on those private markets and on those VC or private equity opportunities. However, impact investment is moving much more into the mainstream and into the mainstream offerings of uh, what you might call sort of traditional rather than niche asset managers and indeed you know asset owners such as pension uh, funds are increasingly willing to direct large pools of capital to this and in fact one of the problems is a lack of large vehicles inv impact investment vehicles at scale for those larger asset owners within the the sort of listed market we talked a bit earlier about how you deliver impact in listed markets we believe that um, through shareholder engagement and uh, through active ownership you can deliver impact strategies in public as well as private markets. There are also an increasing number of dedicated impact investment vehicles that are listed or that are available on, on, on public markets. So we talked about the Social Impact Investment Trust that Big Society Capital launched just last year. That's the first investment trust for retail smaller retail investors to access on listed markets and there's a you know there's a there's a range of different options across the asset classes to consider i would suggest to um listeners that if you look at our website as, as one that can direct you to some of the available resources which is impactinvest.org.uk but i know georgina you're going to be sending around some information on that as well yes I think that's really helpful because I think it's um, useful to understand that there are a complete range of different types of ways to access impact strategies that are actually very familiar. So there is choice and there's a sort of range of entry points. So that's really helpful. Just picking up a, again on one of the points that you started to talk about earlier is this concept of measuring return. And just to focus a little bit more, I mean, it is a concern that people say, well, you know, this is very difficult. We can't properly measure our impact return. That makes us nervous. And when we're going to go and make 
make an investment, how do we distinguish therefore between a kind of genuine impact investment and something that may be no more than greenwashing. And also if we've got enterprises who are holding themselves out as pursuing impact strategies, how do we hold them to account and make sure they're not just doing the bare minimum to comply, if you like, with, with the noise around them? Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly important and an incredibly valid concern of investors, of the public, and indeed increasingly of policymakers and regulators. I mean, I think that you know, I sometimes think of it as the Wild West. We're in the Wild West of impact investment at the moment, that it it can be compared to uh, sort of the era at the beginning of the 20th century where you had a plethora of different financial reporting standards. And even when I joined the FT in 2001, there wasn't an, a totally uh, internationally accepted international financial reporting standards, which there now are. And it does take time, you know, it takes time for global standards and global measurement systems to coalesce and to and to be widely and universally adopted. So I think we're in a, a stage that can be really confusing for the public and for investors of, yes, a wide range of different standards, different metrics. It's very difficult for investors to compare impact across products, across asset classes. But that's the negative. But the positive is that there's some really um, exciting developments in that field. So for a start, the five important standard setters around sustainable investing have committed to work to, towards convergence of global sustainability standards. And the IFRS Foundation, which is the foundation that oversees international financial reporting standards, is in fact currently consulting on whether it should set up a global sustainability standards board. And um, if it did, obviously, that would be a very important development because you would have sustainability standards and financial standards sitting under the same oversight and sort of governance it's i mean frankly we see we believe that we will move to a world where sustainability and financial return are seen as inextricably part of the same thing and you will all organizations all businesses all investors will have to report against sustainability as well as financial metrics i mean we don't believe that there is a, a, for a business to be genuinely sustainable and to have genuinely sustainable profit streams in the future it is going to have to behave sustainably and we're already seeing that in the market i mean you know we've seen for example in the last year, record in inflows into ESG funds and companies like oil producers, you know, really being punished by the market, frankly. So that's what's happening globally. There's some really interesting things happening in the UK as well, specifically, where the Financial Reporting Council is also consulting on it, the future of corporate reporting. And it is one of the things that it's um, asking for responses on is whether all large listed companies should have to produce what they're calling a public interest report. And for us, that would be essentially an, an impact report where they would have to report on their behaviour, on, on the impact of their operations on all stakeholders, so not just shareholders. So I think that concept of sort of multi-stakeholder capitalism and of businesses having a broader responsibility than to just shareholders is also becoming more and more widespread and more and more a, a concept that's being promoted by regulators and policymakers, and I think for example with the new administration in the US there's a real willingness to sort of engage in in the processes that are needed to actually make businesses more accountable for all their stakeholders and not just investors. So it's a global movement then I suppose it's an unfair question to say whether or, or to be able to say whether there's any sort of time frame within which we might expect to see material movements in these areas have they set themselves particular time frames or is it unknown at the moment yeah I, I suppose I mean you know I would say the most significant time frame is that we know that if we don't address the climate emergency there will be no livable world for us to retire into or indeed for our future generations to inherit so there is a very very demanding and urgent time scale that you know really should be impelling us all to action I think that however there are some also some other important sort of moments one is 
the UK's hosting of COP26, the climate conference next November. Now, Mark Carney, the former Bank of England governor, is in charge. He's advising the um, government on COP26 and he is the in charge of the private finance agenda for COP26. And already um, there's some very interesting and important work being done. The UK government has said that all larger companies will have to report against TCFD, which is the climate financial, climate related financial disclosures. And this is a really important step because it's the first time that such standards, climate related standards have been mandatory for companies to report against. And I think that's going to be the, you know, that's going to be the beginning of a broader framework within which companies and investors are going to be able to be transparent about their their positive and most importantly as well we have to remember their negative impacts. I think another important sort of goal is the sustainable development goals the 17 sustainable development goals which have a a deadline of 2030 and that's not very far away. I think there is some scepticism about how many of those goals are going to be reached by 2030 but I think they provide a very important framing for action by people, by individuals, by investors, by businesses, by regulators and by policymakers and indeed by the multilateral actors. They they have really concentrated the mind. So and and, and then finally, I mean, just the the thing I feel looking back on it as a, you know, someone who worked in financial in the financial markets and financial journalism for 20 years, there is a real sense of urgency and momentum behind this and I'm, I'm sure you're finding this in conversations yeah. with clients I mean people always say oh it's younger generations feel that this is you know feel this is so important well I agree they do and they're amazing and amazing activists and thinkers in that generation but older generations are also <laughs> really minding about this and you know really wanting to engage with their advisors whether it's financial advisors or lawyers or asset managers to deliver more positive impact and for their consumer behavior and their investor behavior to be much more closely aligned with their values than they have been in the past. No, I absolutely agree with that the desire to blend the intellectual capital as well um, to, to really find solutions to big problems in society is definitely something that we've seen across generations. So if I can turn slightly now to look at a little bit more closely at the point that we touched on earlier. We work for a number of trustees, for example, and they're often looking after dynastic wealth for families, but they are, you know, keen to consider impact strategies. But sometimes I think there's a concern that perhaps, you know, the preservation and enhancement of the capital of the trust fund for future generations might be inconsistent with an impact strategy. I think from our conversation, it seems that actually we've discussed there's a range of products, there's a range of access points in the market. So all the way from philanthropy to actually outperforming the market in certain certain um, asset classes. I know that the Institute has done quite a lot of work in the area of fiduciary duties. Are you able to put a little bit more colour on some of the considerations that people need to think about in this area? Absolutely. So when we started um, our work at the Institute, we were really trying to lower the barriers that stop people engaging with impact investment and incorporating it into their investment strategies. And we found that for fiduciaries, the one of the absolutely biggest hurdle was a belief that fiduciary duty was income impact investment was incompatible with fiduciary duty. And that's partly due to sort of historic sort of shifts in the way fiduciary duty has been interpreted and, and a narrowing really of the interpreting of interpretation of fiduciary duty as a a sole focus on delivering financial return. Now we have, we're lucky enough to work with a pro bono legal panel, um, which now has 12 legal firms on it and who support our work at the Institute. And they have done a, they have produced a legal paper, which should give comfort on the particular issue of your fiduciary duty being not just compatible with impact investment, but really, we argue you should be thinking about your positive and your negative impact as a fiduciary, that that actually is an integral part of your of your fiduciary duty. So that's the legal paper. But what we've done is worked with that legal paper and used it as the basis for a set of impact investment principles. And those principles, there are four of them, are designed to help you have conversations 
both within your your group of trustees but first of all help you start the conversation and then help you think about the different steps and, and the different considerations that you that you need to discuss before you develop an impact investment strategy and then incorporate it into your for example your statement of investment principles so i would urge everyone to go to our website and look for these impact investment principles which are on the home page because we found them to provide a really a really good framework for the discussion and and to help your thought process when you're sort of thinking through your choices here we are also um we've we've started an adopters forum for the principles because we believe that we want to learn from people who adopt them to develop them further but also we really think there is a role for pioneers and people to champion these principles to get the word out to other firms and and other organizations and other individuals and investors as to how to engage with impact investment. That's really interesting. I have actually looked at those principles on the website and I would encourage other people to to do the same because I think, you know, as you say, they're not directly incompatible. Obviously, one always has to take your own advice on the legal structures and the framework that's governing you, but it isn't necessarily inconsistent with a sustainable. In fact, it's, it is consistent with a sustainable long term vision to be incorporating these sorts of impact principles, I think, in your thinking when you're looking to create that balanced portfolio. So that's really helpful. If we start to think about the future of impact investing and what it's going to look like, we've touched on the fact that there's this sort of increased public spending gap and presumably it is in the interest of international governments to try and drive more capital and private capital towards social good. Are there specific things that are in the pipeline now that policymakers are going to do or are doing to try and encourage our capital towards um, social good? And how is the Institute getting involved with that? Yes, I mean, I, I think there's probably never been a time certainly in our lifetimes Georgina when there's been more of a need to mobilize private sector capital at scale for public good you know we're looking at a situation for decades probably of governments that are going to be under such cash constraints because of the pandemic and its consequences and also that's colliding really with the positive developments that we've talked about of investors both recognising the financial opportunities. I mean, Mark Carney refers to climate, the opportunities that the climate emergency presents as the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. And I always, I mean, it's a slightly sort of almost a jarring thing to say, but I think he's absolutely right. And I think that there is an increasing recognition of, of the opportunities associated with impact investment and sustainable finance more generally. So, I mean, one of the really positive developments that we've been involved in is the UK government's announcement of its first green sovereign bond, its first green gilt, which it plans to issue later this year, probably to coincide with COP26 in November. And we at the Institute worked with two other organisations, the Green Finance Institute and the uh, Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics to develop a proposal around what we called a Green Plus Gilt, which is really presenting our absolutely fundamental belief that you can't think about environmental outcomes without considering the impact on people and communities. Mm -hmm. And that's both mitigating the negative consequences of that transition, but also seizing the opportunities that that transition brings. And the sort of framework is is the approach we is called the just transition approach. And I think it's becoming increasingly important and increasingly widely held. Now, the UK government, when when the Chancellor announced the Green Guilt, he spoke very explicitly about the role of that financing instrument in financing green jobs and green jobs, most importantly, in more disadvantaged areas of the country. And I think that, you know, there is an incredible opportunity here in the transition to a net zero economy to really, you know, make our upgrade the skills in the economy so that we're much more future fit. We have an economy that is, you know, not just net zero, but where it has a workforce who have decent jobs, but with the skills needed to deliver that that net zero world. We're absolutely delighted that the government is, is really sort of um, on board with that with that thinking. So we're continuing to engage with the relevant policymakers over the social co-benefits of environmental projects and we'll continue to do so as the year goes on. But I think also this is, you know, this is absolutely not just a UK development. This is something that lots of other countries and regions are also thinking about. So the EU, for example, has a just transition fund. Um, we're seeing with the Biden administration in the US 
um, some real, you know, obviously they've rejoined the US will, re will rejoin the Paris Agreement, but some really important national and hopefully international developments in this space. But I mean, there is a real, you know, there is not just an opportunity here, but there is a real willingness on the part of many investors, which we've also spoken about, to, to get engaged both because this is a commercial opportunity, but also because, you know, this will deliver the kind of world that we all want to live in. Well, I think it sounds certainly incredibly exciting. And it's nice to hear also that there's that kind of inevitable link, isn't there, between the environmental and social. And I think the environment has rightly, you know, been at the forefront of the agenda. But I think the pandemic has shown us that there are pressing social issues as well. And so the idea that the Green Bond could help with those sorts of things and that internationally we're all moving in the, in the same direction, I think, is, is certainly very exciting and um, positive news. In terms of the kind of, uh, you touched again on this earlier, the supply and demand, is the demand outstripping the supply of um, investments at scale? And how do you see that sort of developing as we move forward at such a, a kind of rapid pace? Well, I think that what we've touched a bit on the history of impact investment, and it used to be the case that some impact investments were both not suitable for all investors, maybe because they were pri offered private market opportunities, but also tended to be at quite a, a relatively small scale. And that if you are a pension fund, for example, a large UK pension fund, you really you need much larger assets, impact assets, before you can really consider um, investing in them. And one of the things that we were able to do with our Green Plus Gilt proposal was really demonstrate that there was market appetite, significant market appetite for impact investments at scale. And that if the government issued a Green Gilt, for example, as it is now brilliantly decided to do, that um, there would be significant demand from large institutional investors. And we also know from the experience of other countries that this type of investment also broadens your investment, the, the investors that you attract. So in Poland, for example, when they issued a green bond, a number of the investors who invested in that instrument had never invested in traditional mm -hmm. Polish sovereign um, instruments. So you attract a broader range of investors. You also provide a sort of demonstrator effect, which is really important. And it's a sort of important signal to the market when the government takes this kind of step. So in Ireland and in Belgium, for example, when after the governments issued their sovereign green bonds, you saw a really significant uptick in local in, in local businesses and in municipalities local authorities issuing their own green bonds so you know you're getting a sort of a domino effect really as more and more sovereigns issue labeled um, bonds whether i mean green green bonds are only one of them you've got sustainable bonds you've got social bonds but also the ripple effects being felt through national markets and you do you know for some types of investors it is those uh, investments at scale that are most needed and as we know, the, the needs, the social and environmental needs are huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to mobilise many tens of billions of pounds worth more of capital to address the transition to, to net zero. Well, it certainly sounds like the momentum is there and it's, it must be a very exciting time to be a part of, of this journey with the um, Impact Investing Institute. Just to wrap up with final thoughts, I think it would be a wasted opportunity if as the former business editor of the FT, I didn't ask you what you think the headline grabbing issues are going to be for impact investment in 2021. I think the, the, the big thing that's happening in 2021 is not just the UK's hosting of COP26, but also its leadership of the G7. And I think this is a real moment for the UK to show visionary leadership in sustainable finance. We have an opportunity, and I was not a fan of Brexit, but Brexit provides an opportunities as, as well. And one of those opportunities is for the city to build on its deep pool of expertise already in sustainable finance, but really step up the pace and step up to the challenge of offering to the rest of the world really globally competitive product in impact investment, but also thinking taxonomies. You know, this, this sustainable finance is the future of finance. And London remains one of the largest financial centres in the world. So now is the time for us to really embrace the opportunities that sustainable finance presents. For anybody who would like to find out more about the issues that we have discussed today, Sarah, where could they find more useful information or links? Well, I would um, urge them to consult our website 
And one of the things that we've got on our website, um, which we just recently launched, is a learning hub, which is a sort of interactive, modular um, learning resource where it goes from what you might call the basics, sort of explaining what impact investment is, to some much more sort of sophisticated information for people either on quite far along their impact investment journey or wanting to implement a sort of more uh, complex in impact investment strategies. So do go there and have a look. Sarah Gordon, CEO of the Impact Investing Institute. It has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georgina. Pleasure talking to you.